Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Uh, I see some people still coming into the uh, webinar room here, so we'll give them just a minute and we'll get started. Uh, if you have any issues, please uh, uh, type any questions into the chat box if you're having it, uh, any problems. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a water quality outreach webinar that will cover maintenance issues regarding green infrastructure best management practices. These BMPs have become the preferred approach for stormwater storage and advance by local, regional, and federal agencies, as well as private landowners. However, sometimes maintenance can be challenging, especially when access is an issue. This webinar will explore different approaches to green infrastructure maintenance, including the use of amphibious equipment that not only gets the job done, but can also save money in the process. This is a free webinar and one PDH will be available for your participation. We have several of these workshops throughout the year. We find that these workshops are a great way to connect like-minded organizations and individuals uh, who are concerned with protecting the water quality in the lakes, rivers, and streams in the Chicago land area. Uh, this webinar, uh, or the workshop, is, is part of our public outreach and education program and helps us meet requirements outlined in our ILR 40 permit with the US EPA, or IEPA, rather. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so if you know of others that couldn't be with us today, and might benefit from this information, we will provide a link to the recorded presentation uh, shortly after the program. Uh, before we begin, just a couple thank yous. Uh, thank you to Mary Mitros. She is our communications, stormwater communications supervisor, and she is behind the scenes running our program today. I'd also like to thank the Conservation Foundation. They are partners for all of these workshops and webinars, uh, specifically Jan Rail. She is the DuPage County Program Director for the Foundation, and she usually helps us line up our speakers. Uh, speaking of our speakers, thanks to Keith Gray. He is the president of Integrated Lakes Management, uh, who will be giving our presentation today. And finally, uh, once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, just a couple other quick remarks before we begin. Uh, this is our first webinar in 2022. So I just want to say Happy New Year to everyone. I hope everyone is keeping up with their brand new New Year's resolutions. Uh, this year for our resolution, my wife and I have decided we uh, wanted to uh, give more to charities throughout the year. Uh, over the holidays, instead of getting our kids a ton of gifts, uh, we made a donation to the Re Ronald McDonald House Foundation. Now, needless to say, the kids were a little bit disappointed. Uh, and my son, who, who's in high school, actually said, I know that giving to charities is very important, but... How big a house does that damn clown need? <laughs> Yikes. Uh, looks like uh, we may need to do a little bit more education to let them know what the Ronald McDonald House Foundation is actually all about. Uh, anyway, that's not important right now. What is important is we are going to learn about ma uh, maintenance of green infrastructure BMPs. Uh, but before I turn things over to Keith, I do want to remind everybody that you are muted. If you do have comments or questions during the presentation, uh, please type them directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to Keith um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, just a side note, uh, everyone is uh, responsible for their own video cameras. So whether you want that camera on or off is completely up to you. All right, so let me introduce our speaker. Again, it's Keith Gray. He is the president of Integrated Land Management, ILM. Uh, prior to acquiring ILM in 2005, Keith was the co-founder and vice president of an environmental testing service. They concentrated on water and industrial wastewater compliance testing and specialized in stormwater runoff, water quality, and volume monitoring. He holds two patents for devices that aid in the monitoring of runoff water. 
a presenter at the Chicago Wilderness Corporate Council, Keith has shown ILM's research of alternatives to chemical, contr to chemical control of algae and nuisance aquatic plant growth in ponds. Keith has been collaborating with manufacturers of amphibious platforms to create equipment well suited for wetland management. Uh, and so with that, uh, again, Keith, thanks for being with us. And uh, Mary, let's turn things over to Keith uh, so that we can start the presentation. Great, thank you, Chris. And, and there's one more thank you. I wanna thank Lisa Wolford for pulling this whole presentation together. Um, it's a lot harder than it looks. I wouldn't even attempt it. So Lisa, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me and, and it's an honor to be here. And, and I wanna preface this by saying, um, this is not intended at all to be a how-to at all. Um, it, everybody knows that green infrastructure is an evolving science, art, um, technique. And, and this is more about what we've learned in, in trying to maintain a lot of these BMPs and the green infrastructure and what's possible. Uh, I think that um, if we share information, uh, the learning curve for all of us is gonna be a lot shorter. And, and that's, again, thanks to the Conservation Foundation for hosting um, seminars like this, because uh, I look forward to hearing from other folks about their experiences and um, to, to listen to whatever added knowledge people can give at the end of this presentation um, to enrich us all. So it's all about moving things forward for, for the good of nature and the good of the earth. And uh, I'm, I'm just uh, blessed really to be a part of this business. Uh, um, it's been a lot of fun for us and I hope you can see that we have fun and by, by the, what I'm about to show you. I guess fun's all in the eye of the beholder. It's not always that much fun, but try to keep a positive attitude. Okay, so let's let's move on. Green infrastructure maintenance, it can be successful. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna make sure, I didn't get the next slide yet. There we go. I wanna make sure everybody um, understands what we're talking about. I, I, I'm assuming they do, but I, I don't wanna make that assumption. Um, gray infrastructure historically is concrete piping, it could be tile piping, it could be metal piping. But when we talk about gray infrastructure to handle stormwater, it's, it's really piping that moves the water from point A to point B very, very quickly. And, um, and it, it does a great job of doing that, right? It, 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 it takes water out of a parking lot or whatever, wherever you don't want it and gets it out of the way. Um, when you have enough of that going on, you overwhelm the receiving waters. And, and what's happened is these receiving waters are now um, highly eroded. Um, the, the sediment is moving from point A to point B. What, what was formerly stream banks is now um, mud flats somewhere else or, or clogs. We're gonna see some clogs later on. Um, green infrastructure really is about replacing those pipes with, with something more natural, a ditch, and if you look at that second slide there, that's a ditch. And okay, now you've got a little wider channel that maybe that water is gonna move slower, that's great. But it's still highly erodible because those slopes are very abrupt. Um, to the third slide, um, where we have a channel, I'm sorry, <laughs> let's go back. To the third image on the second slide, where we have a channel that is, is much, much wider and has the capacity to take an enormous amount of water and whose sides are stabilized with um, native plants, not turf like the, uh, the, the, the sketch shows, but native plants that serve multiple purposes. It slows the flow down a little bit. It holds the soil in place. And hopefully it's grabbing onto some of the nutrients um, as that water is, is maybe sitting in these conveyances. So, so when we have green infrastructure, which is, is the introduction um, noted the way people are going when they're designing um, regional management plans for stormwater. Um, these things tend to need maintenance. Um, I, I like to think that ponds, stormwater retention ponds, is really kind of the granddaddy of green infrastructure. Um, they were designed to hold water for some period of, period of time, let the solids settle out, and let cleaner water go to that waterway in a controlled fashion. Um, things have evolved significantly in a very, very good way, but a lot of these green infrastructure techniques have been around for decades and they need some help. So we're going to talk a little bit about 
what we've been facing out there. And, and again, I, I look forward to hearing from anybody else who can offer more. So now we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> you know, one of the challenges we found is that there is ambiguity as to who's responsible to maintain it. Um, is it the homeowner or property owner in some cases? We've had situations where, you know, the, the work needed to be done on private property, the municipality was able to pick up some of those costs. Um, the Homeowners Association, of course, is an extension of the homeowner, but it's a non-for-profit. So an HOA may be able to qualify for grant funding, whereas a homeowner can't. Um, developers who, who take virgin land and develop it into something else and then is tasked with trying to manage stormwater may be on, I won't say on the hook, that's negative, but may be responsible for maintaining that for some period of time before handing it over. And um, we, we've seen every which way this can happen. And um, quite often it ends up with somebody that doesn't have a whole lot of money, which is a shame. But um, understanding who's responsible is something that might wanna be explored way ahead of time. Um, we're gonna go through one case study where uh, there was kind of an emergency situation and things had to happen fast. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I, I guess, the learning here is figure out who's responsible. I'll share one bit of, uh, um, I'm in North Carolina right now and I'm grateful for technology to be able to do this. We're an Illinois company and I spend almost all my time in Illinois uh, and Wisconsin to a lesser extent, but uh, we're on Christmas break here in North Carolina and happened to be looking at a job, an incredibly large job. And um, the, the short story is in North Carolina, if there is erosion or management requirements for stormwater conveyance on your property. In this state, it is the property owner and their feet are held to the fire here. And it's, it's um, I don't wanna say it's any easier, but it's certainly clear who's responsible in North Carolina. Whereas in Illinois, it, it um, isn't quite so clear to me and, and maybe I'm missing something. And if there are people who work for, for municipalities or, or counties in the audience, I'd love to hear from you at the end of this to, um, to get more, more information regarding that. So let's go to the next slide. So green infrastructure maintenance, um, and, and this is a, a very broad stroke at, at this, but it's really meant to do differentiate between what is maintenance and what is kind of a reset or remediation. Um, a routine maintenance um, is an inspection checklist with hopefully measurable indicators. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, so let's use a, a stormwater retention pond that has several pipes coming in and one culvert going out as the green infrastructure to help manage stormwater. Okay, so, so how do we know that this pond is still doing its job? Does somebody go and measure um, water quality going in versus water quality going out? Is it working as designed? What is the hold time of the water coming through there per one inch of rain? Is the sediment filling up um, to the point where it needs um, some type of, of work? Um, what is that threshold? You know, it, there are a lot of things that can give you an idea that things might be close to needing attention, um, but there's nothing really concrete. Um, the state of Wisconsin has actually done a good job moving forward with, with trying to put quantifiable indicators or, or limits or thresholds on certain aspects of green infrastructure. And I would imagine that there's a lot of that kind of work happening um, maybe on a national level, but certainly behind the scenes in at a state level in different states. Um, so green infrastructure is managing stormwater. We all know that stormwater is um, more common, I guess. It's, it's a more common issue than it used to be because of the intensity of the rains and maybe because of the, um, the, the significance of development within a certain area, right? Impermeable surfaces and the like. Um, as stormwater creates flashiness in green infrastructure, flashiness being um, widely fluctuating water levels. And let's go back to my example of a stormwater pond. Some of those shoreline plants won't be able to stand the inundation of water. And so they'll need to be um, replaced, whether you're replanting or, or seeding them. We would, we, we would expect that to happen. And there should be a budget to do that. Um, again, this, this shouldn't be in a, a fire drill, an emergency situation. If anybody has green infrastructure, there is going to be some planting and overseeding 
to be done as that, as that thing is used over time. Of course, invasive species management plays back to, um, you know, trying to get native plants in place. Uh, and having an annual budget, I think, is incredibly important. The former slide talked about who's responsible. Once you figure out who's responsible, is there actually a budget dedicated to this? Our experience has been that the landscaping budget gets robbed. Um, something happens within the, the, the green infrastructure or the BMP, and that money is going to have to come from landscaping. And, and then it's, it's a shuffle. Uh, I, think, I think good planning regarding spending and, and looking at the three bullet points above the budget bullet point uh, is a good start for, for folks to try to uh, not get dinged when things go bad. Um, aside from maintenance, there might be, it's too late for maintenance. The, the, whatever we're looking at is, is just got to be reset or remediated. Um, there may be a very large cost to that. I'm talking about dredging a pond or we're going to talk about rechannelizing wetlands. Um, these are big money things. And, and if you do a lot of maintenance or you do the maintenance at the right time, um, you, can, you can push that off for a long, long time. But ultimately, it's going to have to be there. So sometimes reserve studies are um, considering these types of needs. And, and I think those are, um, those are really handy to have in place. Um, I talked a little bit about what are the signs, you know, what are the indicators or the thresholds of when something needs to be remediated. The bottom line is, if it's not working, and it's really obvious it's not working, and, and flooding is the most apparent sign of something not working right, it's time. Um, that's, that's pretty easy. And again, hopefully you don't get to that point, but, but if you do, um, it's pretty obvious. Um, identifying funding sources, again, thinking way ahead. So if you can anticipate that there is going to be something big happening, you know, we're going to have to um, re-slope our shoreline or we're going to have to stabilize things so there's not erosion or whatever that is. Um, quite often that work can be done in conjunction with other work that may qualify for grants or might be done as part of a greater watershed initiative. So thinking way ahead about what might be needed uh, and planning that far ahead is going to make things move a lot better. Go ahead and next slide, please. Um, so the four, we'll call them case studies, um, all had certain barriers for us. Um, one was it's just too wet and it's not an easy access situation. One required frozen conditions. One project, Fiddle Creek, had some legacy challenges. Um, I actually can't see what the other one, the sediment accumulation one is, I um, can't remember which one it was. And the communication afterwards is, is gonna be an important one. We had situations where we've gone in, um, done some work, some maintenance, some restoration work, and it, it kind of got undone um, because we didn't communicate well what was going on. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide. So uh, again, this is more about um, what's possible and what we've learned as opposed to how to. Um, what we've done is, is we've grown to rely on using amphibious equipment. Um, a lot of, of what we do is in ecologically sensitive areas. And there's great concern, rightfully so, about compacting roots and leaving ruts, um, even accessing from um, streets that weren't designed to carry heavy equipment. And so we've accumulated a lot of um, light equipment. A lot of this equipment's aluminum, but even better, their footprint allows for an incredibly low ground pressure. And, and so what does that mean? Well, a human being has, and that's me in the Blackhawks jersey there, um, a human being has, or at least I do, um, a 0.93 pounds per square inch um, ground pressure. Um, a boy-tailed deer weighing that guy right there probably weighs 225 pounds or 250 pounds. And if you do the math and, and what his footprint is, he's exerting about four pounds per square inch. So he's coming down four times harder or with four times the force than I am walking through the forest um, or a wetland or whatever it is. Um, our marsh master is right at what a human is and that amphibious excavator is just slightly more than that. So, you know, you can kind of get a sense that when, when these specialty machines show up, we're very, very kind to the land and we're not gonna um, hopefully leave fingerprints when we're done. Next slide, please. 
So our first case study is the village of Haynesville. Um, the, the village of Haynesville has several wetland complexes and they are interconnected um, to move stormwater through. It makes perfect sense. <clears throat> there was, um, it wasn't a flooding situation. Um, these were overgrown with vet, uh, vegetation and they were causing standing water. I, I think during high flows, I think things were flowing nicely, but during non-flow or non-rain events, there was a lot of standing water. And, and there was an issue of um, pests like mosquitoes and algae growth and some odor issues. And, and so we were asked to go in and to re-channelize the conveyances in between the wetland complexes. Um, the problem, the challenge we faced here is that traditional equipment in no way was gonna get there. You can see the concentration of houses. These are all residential streets um, designed for cars, not very large trucks, certainly not trucks loaded with material. Um, and, and so the challenge here was to, you know, how do we tiptoe in and out of these um, residential areas? And how do we get this material up and out of there without doing a lot of damage? And, and this is where some of this amphibious equipment um, came in handy. One slide forward, please. So as I said, the channels conveyed water through the, the wetlands. It wasn't easily accessible. We wound up using the Marshmaster quite a bit with a backhoe attachment um, to access the areas. I mean, this machine is about six and a half feet wide. Um, we were able to get in between houses. Um, we were able to kind of go around ornamental shrubs and trees and, and really squeeze into areas that would otherwise be impossible. And, and I would like to just take a break here. Again, I'm not sure what the um, professions are or the area of concentration is of a lot of the attendees. But, you know, as we look at a lot of these challenges, one thing that comes to mind is, I think when, when engineers or designers lay these things out, whatever they may be, shopping centers or residential areas or, or neighborhoods, whatever, um, I don't know that there's a lot of consideration given to the maintenance of the BMPs that ultimately are going to have to have some work done to them. And, and so um, it's just something to think about. If it's done right, if not that it's been done wrong, it was just done without consideration of, oh my God, what do we have to do in four years, right? So I, I think if there's any designers or planners out there thinking about access for some of the um, equipment or the personnel or the materials that have to go in, in, go in or come out um, to maintain these things would, would probably go a long, long way of helping to control costs. So it's, I guess, a request, a plug, whatever you want to call it for what it's worth. Um, next slide, please. So what you see on the left is really a channel that is, is a channel. You can see it right through the, the cattails. It's, it's okay, there's a channel and water is going to flow through there. Again, the problem was is that enough of the cattails have died and grown and died and grown and died and grown to raise the kind of the, the elevation of the bottom of that channel to a point where this water is just going to be hanging there. And it was never really intended to do that as we looked at the original um, drawings for this development. And, and so this, the slide to the right or the picture to the right on the screen is what it looks like from our operator's vantage as he's going through this channel um, he's getting that channel back down to its original elevation, and we're actually widening it a little bit, kind of like in that um, depiction at the very beginning of, of this presentation, where there's kind of a trapezoidal opening um, with, with sides that aren't going to fail. And um, this is, in the end, it's going to need some maintenance afterwards. It's, it's certainly a wetland channel. It's now functional. But anybody who knows cattails and phragmites knows that it's not going to be long before that channel just closes right back up. So, so there is going to be kind of like a secondary maintenance needed on this type of a, a project. Let's go to the next one. Um, so, so scooping out cattails is, is really kind of the method that you saw previous. There's actually a way to control cattail growth by drowning them. Um, this sounded ridiculous to me when I first heard about it years ago, but it's true. Um, if you can control the water level in some of these wetlands, and many of these wetlands do have a weir on the back side of them, or, or maybe you can artificially flood an area for some period of time. Um, 
you can cut the cattail plant below the surface of the water and actually, and if you do it at the right time in its growth stage, you can actually kill the plant and its rhizomes um, without chemicals. It's, it's actually quite cool. And I think um, we did this at Fermilab down in Batavia in, in kind of a sidebar. Um, not only were they happy with the result, but they were ecstatic by the wildlife that showed up in what was this former cattail marsh. And, and that picture on the right shows that a little bit. There may be a video of this machine doing its thing next. I, I hope it is. If we don't, can you go to the next? Next. Um... The Truxor, another piece of the Integrated Lakes Management Fleet, removes unwanted plants from the shoreline and below the water surface. Cutting beneath the water surface, raking the cut material out of the water, and then depositing it for cleanup, the Truxor quickly clears ponds of unwanted vegetation. Yeah, so that's a great plug for Truxor. Um, this machine is made in Sweden. Uh, it's a really nice machine, and um, I'll tell you, it, aside from the custom situation and the spare parts challenges, um, I would recommend it to anybody. It's it's really a nice machine. We just bought a second one, so um, it it it, it um, has multiple. It's, it's called a multiple tool carrier, so it can have a cutter on it. It can have a rake on it, and a lot of the tools that it can come with are really exactly what's needed to to maintain these wetlands, the conveyances within these wetlands. So um, yeah, that's as much a plug for a truckster as it is for anything else. And we like them. Next slide, please. The trucks. So Grasmere HOA, um, this one was, um, I referred to kind of an emergency situation earlier. Um, this was an emergency. This was a, a, a project that was designed to use heavy equipment in the winter. Uh, the ground was supposed to be frozen solid. There were gonna be a lot of mats laid out that were gonna allow excavators and dump trucks and skid steers to get out into the marshy area and do the restoration work. Um, but you know, there were three or four years in a row where we just weren't getting the really hard freeze that was needed for this project to happen the way it was designed. Um, and, and truly, I don't remember how we wound up falling into this project, but um, if you look at Route 59 there on the left part of this image, um, that yellow line, the dashed line, is the conveyance. And the solid line up to the right of that is really where everything was blocked up. Um, and that was nearly a half mile long. Well, what was happening is that blockage um, where the solid line is was forcing Route 59 to, it was flooding. Even with mild um, rains, things were backing up to the point where you can hydroplane if you were coming down that hill on Route 59, that's a low point there, of course, um, you can really hydroplane right across that water. It was terrible. Um, and there was a, a bad accident there. And suddenly this, this job that was waiting for frozen ground had to be done right away. Um, and, and so if we go forward here a little bit, um, without this, part of, of the, our equipment, um, we could never have done that. And it's, it's called a slick sled. Um, I developed this with a gentleman down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, but it's, it's towed by the Marshmaster. And what we're able to do is we were to, able to tow it into this area with that amphibious equipment. This can hold up to 4,000 pounds of material, has a flat bottom, which is a lower ground pressure than even a human being. It actually floats, uh, which is nice. And then that hydraulic lift um, will actually enable it to be unloaded up in a highland area that either stays there, the material will either stay there and decompose, um, or after it, it, it dries further, it can be loaded up and hauled off with access for the traditional heavy equipment. I think the next slide shows all three of these components kind of together. So we had the large excavator to actually straddle that channel and, and dig things out. It loaded it up onto the sled. You can see the material there. And then this thing's towed up and out of that wetland with the Marshmaster. So for a project that was supposed to happen with rock solid ground, using amphibious equipment enabled this to happen, you can see, when things are green and certainly very soft. Um, the, the pleasant surprise is the next slide. Um, and, and I hope, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but if 
if you were to try to compare costs, the traditional approach being the left column, heavy equipment and matting, and then what wound up happening using amphibious equipment, um, all the way down the line, the costs were lower. And, and so and this was a real eye-opener for us and, and certainly the clients um, in that what turned out to be originally a $200 plus thousand dollar job um, came in at less than $100,000. So everybody was pleased. It, it happened when it needed to happen and it happened at a cost that was far less than people had expected or budgeted for. So um, we decided we need to do more of this and, and we are, which is, um, it's been good. So um, if you wanna go back and if anybody has questions about this, um, I hope at the end you, you write down my email address and I can dive into this a lot more if you like. But um, for those who are designing projects, um, you, can, you can advise potential contractors on approaches, or you can just say, this is what needs to be done and see what they come back at, at you with. Um, because every company has different ways of doing things and, and different capabilities and different areas of expertise. So um, I'm not advocating that you advocate for one way or the other. I'm just saying, as they did in the beginning, this is more about what is possible as opposed to this is how you need to do it. Next one, please. Fiddle Creek Drainage District. This is out near Wakanda. Um, again, a very similar situation in that these are vast wetlands that um, were, were not conducting water anymore. Um, water was going in sometimes, it certainly wasn't going out um, in, in, in these wetlands were, were just uh, in need of a lot of attention. Um, it was a wetland channeling um, and this time it also had Phragmites. Um, next slide. Before this wetland was a wetland, um, which it currently is, it was actually in agriculture. And, and, and you know, so it was probably a wetland and somebody had put in drain tiles. And, and of course, I don't remember thousands of miles of drain tiles are in Illinois. It's like it goes around the world several times. It's incredible. Um, but once those drain tiles were decommissioned and this land was allowed to go back to being a wetland, um, nobody bothered to take out the fencing or the posts. So the next slide. Um, <laughs> you know, when the cattails grow six, seven feet tall and, and, and within it, you have a lot of these wire fences. You know, this is what I talk about. It's fun. It's not really fun. It's funny after the fact. Um, we, we had a really hard time with this. And you can imagine our tracks going at this and then suddenly you're mired in a bunch of barbed wire. And it was a nightmare. Um, this is an example I, I show because anybody who's looking to do maintenance of wetlands should be absolutely aware of prior uses and what may be there. Um, you know, was it a disposal area for broken up concrete? Is there rebar? Certainly old fencing is gonna be an issue. Um, all these things um, we've seen and all of them present challenges. And, and if it's not known at the front end, it can really throw a project off track. So, um, you know, again, what looks to be the same, oh my God, here's, you know, 20 acres of cattails. We can channelize that. What can go wrong? Well, a lot can go wrong. And, and, and sometimes people may want to do kind of a reconnaissance run through there to see if there's any legacy issues that need to be dealt with ahead of maybe the restoration. Next one, please. So um, this one kind of came at us from a, a different angle. Um, <clears throat> in rural areas, people may or may not know this, when there isn't um, traditional pressurized fire hydrants available for fire suppression, the way firefighters serve an area is through pumping water from ponds. Um, and and the, the, the neat way to do this, neat meaning tidy way to do this, you know, instead of trying to, to go down a slope and, and dump a, a pump inlet into the water or on top of the ice and, and all that, is to plug into what's called a dry hydrant. So the pipe you see in the foreground of this picture um, basically goes down and out to that pond. Now, the Illinois legislature passed a rule, I wanna say two, maybe three years ago that talked about requiring performance testing of these dry hydrants. 
So the rural fire districts were tasked with going out and hooking up to these things and pumping through them and, and mean, uh, ensuring or documenting that they were able to pump a certain velocity or volume of water um, to, to meet some you know, code for safety. It makes all sense in the world. And, and of course, what was being found is that these things aren't, they're underperforming. And the reason they're underperforming is because that stormwater detention pond, which is a BMP and its dual purpose is now fire suppression, has silted the inlet of that fire hydrant in. So, so this now becomes an issue of who pays, right? It's the HOA's um, property and their pond, but it's the fire district's need to make sure that this is all working right. And uh, actually, I don't even know who really paid on this, but um, it's not for me to decide. Next, the next slide, please. So we, we it being a residential area, and most of these are, um, we were able to go in with amphibious equipment. This particular pond was much too large to draw down all the way. Um, and to do a complete set in removal, it, it was just um, cost prohibitive. And so what was decided was to draw this pond down to just below the inlet and to remove a limited amount of sediment um, near that inlet. Next slide, please. Um, and here's a photo of the exposed pipe. It was formerly under a foot of sediment and, and you know, we had to go out there and probe it and find it. We did and, and um, not break it while we're doing that work. So it's kind of delicate. And, um, and, and so once we exposed that pipe, we agreed with the client, you know, how much area around that pipe do we need of cleared sediment free pond bottom to satisfy your needs? And um, the next slide will show um, that 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 pool of water is surrounded by a permeable stone barrier that's really designed to hold the accumulating sediment back from the pipe inlet for that dry hydrant. So, you know, we'll call this a partial dredge followed by, um, followed by a technique that allows water to come through but not sediment to creep in to that inlet. Um, this required some interesting permitting. Um, as you may imagine, there's local permits. Um, because we're, we're talking about fill within a, a water body, there's Army Corps involved. And uh, everything is different, of course. But this particular project kind of evolved this way. And in the end, it worked out well. In an ideal world, that pond may need to be fully dredged. Um, that's, that's an enormous cost. And I said at the beginning of this presentation, um, there's a difference between maintenance and there's a difference between reset and, and complete redos, right? And this one was um, kind of buying time, so to speak, which is fine. We think it's gonna last 10 years, we'll see. But um, this is one way to look at, at dealing with managing green infrastructure. It doesn't have to be an all or none type of situation. In this case, we have kind of a, a little bit of each. Next one, please. So this is Westwood Umbrella. I believe this is out near Palatine or Schaumburg or somewhere in that area. But um, we, we've all seen areas that have, for whatever reason, um, held water when maybe they shouldn't. If you see the right of this, this bare area is a tennis court that's, um, it was hardly used because it was usually wet or underwater. Um, this area was just one of these areas that didn't want to dry out. Um, so right, green infrastructure, um, let's do what everybody knows needs to be done and put in some um, evaporative native plants. The next slide will show just a terrific um, result. Next slide. So the tennis court on the right, there's, there's what the native plants look like, right? It's, everybody was just thrilled with this one. The tennis court dried out, um, it's pretty. I think the bees were happy with it and uh, everybody walked away with feeling very, very good about this. Um, 
And what we didn't do and what the client didn't do was to communicate with all parties involved. And um, next slide will show that it was either, I hate to blame landscapers, maybe it was the, um, the baseball league, I don't know, but somebody decided that all that high growth had to disappear. And I'm preaching to the choir here and I don't mean to, um, but it's just a reminder you know, in any of these projects where there's been an area of land that's been not attended to for whatever reason for a long period of time, and then suddenly there's something happening, whether you're clearing frag or cattails or removing sediment or planting natives, um, communication is key. I, I know that that's, um, again, I'm preaching to the choir, but um, these are, you know, the, the, the um, wire fence and the fact that there's no signage here. Next slide, please. Um, are, are simple things that could have been done on the front end to, to really make these projects, um, you know, 100% successes. They were successes. They just had their bumps. And again, I'm here to share the bumps that we've encountered um, in the hopes that you don't have to feel the same pain we have. And, um, and again, I look forward to hearing from everybody here um, after this, and we're getting near the end. Next slide, please. Um, in an open session, um, about what everybody else has learned. So yeah, I know we're winding down. Um, other BMP management options, and, and this is, don't let the sediment get there in the first place. So, you know, manage your lakes and ponds. That You do that by maybe installing an aerator to suppress algal growth. Or when algae shows up, instead of just killing it, pull it out of that system, pull it out of that ecosystem so that those nutrients aren't feeding next year's algal growth. There's the truck show that I talked about. It's, it's a nice vehicle. Um, and, and so there are things people can do on the front end of things with their green infrastructure to not face those big bills later on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about supplemental bacteria because we're getting a lot of calls from clients who want us to use enzymes and bacteria to help reduce the muck, to reduce the sediment. Um, in some cases, um, control algae. And in, I think the theory of enzymes and bacteria are good. Uh, it makes perfect sense, right? It's an organic material. It needs a little help decomposing. We all know that when things decompose, they get smaller and, and therefore your sediment should be reduced. It all makes sense. Um, and, and we use it and, and we, we use it um, usually at clients' requests. Um, what I'll say about this is that it usually needs aeration with it. And, and so if you're gonna take a pond that's or a wetland that's relatively stagnant and below the water surface, you don't have a lot of oxygenation, um, it's not going to work right. And, and so you need other things happening if you're going to consider um, bacteria and enzymes. Um, the other thing I'll say, um, because I'm sitting in North Carolina, as I mentioned, is the, that seems to work really well in warmer climates. And that makes sense too. The water's warmer. The bacteria and enzymes are going to be more active. It has a longer, we'll call it growing season or reproductive season. Um, you know, in Florida, of course, it, it can probably sustain itself all year long. Whereas in the Chicago region, you know, your pond's frozen over in the winter and the water is right around 32 degrees, it's not going to be very active. So, you know, even though there may be case studies that that material or those products work well, um, we have to consider where we live. And if we live in Chicago and Wisconsin, you got to know that it's, it's not going to be working year round. So that's, it's not bad. I'm just saying, be aware of that. Next slide, please. Of course, you know, it's the, the adage, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's why we're all here today is, is we all recognize that it's a watershed approach that it is gonna be the answer. Um, I, I shared with you very individualized techniques that are used to help restore or maintain um, green infrastructure. And, and it's fine, and it, we have to have that. Um, but, but as I said, we in the beginning, if we step back and we think about the whole picture and we think about how we design access and what are we planting where and, you know, all the things that go with good watershed management, um, it, it's going to, um, it's more, more predictable, right? And, and we can work in very, very well in predictable situations. And when we have situations like on Route 59 where, where it takes a horrific car accident, to move a project forward, um, 
you know, now that's the, the, the fire drill that nobody wants to be in. So, um, you know, again, looking at it holistically, and again, I don't think anybody on this call today um, doesn't know this. And, and I'm just, I guess, tipping my hat to all of you. Um, if we work together and look at it holistically, I, I think all this becomes a heck of a lot easier. Next slide, please. Here we go. I knew I was getting close to the end. So I think I finished a little bit ahead of time, but I like that because I, I really am waiting very anxiously to hear some questions or comments. All right, well, thanks, uh, Keith. Uh, great job. That's, I, I haven't seen a lot of that uh, amphibious, amphibious equipment before, so that was very interesting. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, let me just try to relay a couple of those to you. Um, Let's see some of the some some of the comments in the chat were just kind of uh, uh, discussions going back and forth. Uh, but here we have a question from Mary Beth: Have you seen increased algae, algal blooms after drowning cattail? That's a great question, and she obviously has some familiarity with um, where cattails live. Right, cattails don't live in water more than three feet deep, and when you have a water body that's three feet deep and the cattails are gone. Boy, that's like an algae incubator. So yes, uh, it, it's, it's very likely that the next step after cattail removal, if the client is interested in open water, is that there's going to have to be some attention given to algae control. So yeah, I would say, I would say it'd be unusual in a shallow body of water to eradicate cattails and not have either um, algae or, or duckweed wolfia up here in its, in its place. That's, that's true. Okay, very good. Uh, th there was another question. What kind of sediment and erosion control would you use around the amphibious excavator work area? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, that's tough because we, you know, we do leave, um, we map down areas where we track, especially if that sled is going to track around and around and around. Whatever was growing there is going to be bare, um, especially in dry weather. Um, where, where regrowth is not real strong. So it really all depends on whether we're in a wetland or whether we're up and out of the wetland. Um, that image you saw with the three machines or the trailer, the Marshmaster and the um, amphibious excavator, we uh, had a seed and mat the upland areas afterwards, um, but the permit did not require us to reseed the wetland areas. I, I, I believe that um, nature was going to take over there, but because it was a wetland area and it was flat, I think the theory was there was not going to be a lot of erosion because it's it's flat. So, um, you know, there wasn't going to be water water moving one way or the other there. I don't know. I can't answer that. The permit did not require us to restore the wetland area though after we left. Interesting. How, how about you know in, in areas where maybe you're doing some of that uh, excavation. Um, you, you know, maybe uh, erosion control along this, the, the stream bank may not be affected, but do you ever have to use like turbidity, turbidity curtains uh, within the water uh, system? Yeah, um, uh, I think that's going to be dependent. On, so the answer is yes, we've done it both ways. Uh, we have had to use turbidity curtains that's usually dictated by a permit. Um, and there's been in situations where we've not. So think back to the pond with the dry hydrant, um, we were able to lower the pond level down so that there was no discharge happening during our work. So in that case, there was no turbidity curtain needed because nothing was going anywhere. The water level was down. While we were there and we were disturbing sediment, it wasn't going anywhere. Now, if we weren't able to lower that pond down at all and have to work in what we'll call normal conditions or even flowing conditions, undoubtedly there would be a turbidity curtain. So that's I'll answer that by saying that'll be case by case. Yeah. All right, uh, here's another question. Um, doing a wetland channel dredge as pictured, uh, do you have recommendations for getting the sediment and material out of the wetland slash floodplain? Yeah, so that's what that sled was about. It, it gets loaded onto the sled. Um, and I'll share with you, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, it gets loaded on the sled and towed up and out. Now we have had <clears throat> situations where this was nothing more than taking the bucket of the excavator. I don't know if you can see me, but 
but but taking the the material was so soft and so mushy that there was nothing more than taking the excavator bucket and and really widening the ditch in in kind of a lateral motion um and 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 so we're we're kind of compressing the soil um in that wet area to create what was left was a sustainable conveyance so so it doesn't always have to come up and out. Um, sometimes it, it, it can stay in place and we're really just kind of um, reconfiguring what's already there. I should incorporate that if I talk about this again, because that's that's um, that saved that client a lot of money by not having to pull it up and out. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Uh, here's a question from Scott. In ponds with minimal vegetation, what has been your experience with the vacuum sediment pumping and discharge instead of using heavy mechanical equipment. My experience. So that's what what's being referred to there is hydraulic dredging versus mechanical dredging. Um, hydraulic dredging vacuums or sucks up sediment and runs it through a dewatering bag, and, and that water then is returned either to a water body, which has to meet EPA discharge limits, or it is um, surface drained into, let's say, a field. Um, into a field where there's no discernible return to a waterway. It's a little harder to do, but it's, it's done sometimes. Um, my experience. So if the stuff is very soft and, and, and highly um, like releasable, right? We've all stepped into a lake or a pond. And when you put your foot down, you see this plume of, of sediment just appear. Well, you know, imagine trying to shovel that out. It's just not going to happen. You know, you, it's just not going to happen. In that case, there is no choice but to do hydraulic removal of that material. Um, conversely, you have a lot of sand and gravel, or maybe you, you, it, it's very compacted and consolidated. Scooping it out might be your best bet. And, and it, some of this has to do with accessibility. Some of it has to do with um, secondary use. I mean, if you're going to leave the material on site and you have one of these sediment bags, um, maybe that's going to become a berm for somebody somewhere. And that's, that's planned out. And there's a, a cost savings associated with leaving the sediment there versus mechanically pulling it out. And if it's not of good quality, let's say it's sand and gravel and you don't want a berm, now you're having to put in a truck and you're going to have to find a home for that stuff. Um, but, but maybe that's your only choice. So, so our experience is we've done both and it's very site specific, uh, um, having to do with, again, accessibility, the type of material, and secondary use. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, we got a couple more questions here. Uh, another one regarding sediment. How can sediment be safely removed from smaller green infrastructure installations, such as rain gardens and bioswales oh. without harming the plants? Uh, see, right? This is what I'm talking about. I, <laughs> I'm asking all the designers and engineers to think ahead. And then here I am saying, well, yeah, if you have a rain garden and it's it's kind of filled in, so to speak, um, that's a great question. I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that if that rain garden is burnt regularly, you're really reducing that that fiber, that vegetative duff, to a minimal amount, um, and, and and you should be able to not have a situation like a cattail marsh where it accumulates every year. Um, but, but that said, eventually that same rain garden is going to have to be, um, reset. I, you know, I, I'm shooting from the hip here and, and probably the ecologists on our staff would get mad at me for saying this, but, you know, maybe in the off, uh, you know, the dormant season, it's, it's mowed down and scraped and you're hoping that those roots push the plant back up. But, you know, I, I defer to a lot of people on this, this event here to, um, offer any comment on that. Let's see, we got uh, questions to keep coming up. So people are very interested in this. Uh, do you see any efforts in the state to take a watershed approach to storm water, uh, to manage storm water, uh, a watershed approach? Yeah, I mentioned Wisconsin earlier um, because we do a fair amount of work in Wisconsin and it seems that they're, they're just, um, you know, they do things differently. And, and um, what I'll say is this, um, and I'm, I'm, I do keep in touch with the legislative process and I do offer opinion on a lot of things being considered. 
Okay, if you're a public servant or an elected official, um, raising fees and raising taxes is never a popular thing. And so, so there's just a resistance to that on its face, right? Um, but we still are faced with this problem. And, and so where I think things are going is not necessarily that there's gonna be legislation passed, new legislation passed. I think what we're gonna see is amendments or adjustments or modifications to existing rules like NPDES permits, the MS4 program, you know, those types of things that, that steer things over to the areas that we're talking about here. So uh, I, I, I think that's how that goes. And that's, that's a much bigger conversation with a lot of moving parts that I wish I can offer more on, but um, my opinion is, is that it'll, it'll catch up to other states where they're doing it, um, but it's gonna be through existing programs, I think, not new programs, just my opinion. All right, very good. A couple more. Uh, do you have a favorite BMP resource guide that may include some of these long-term considerations? Uh, are there specific items such as maintenance, access, monitoring, et cetera, that you would consider as priorities for adding to existing BMP resources? There's a lot there. There so, is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll start with the first part, the guide. Um, there's several guides out there. The Lake County Stormwater Management has some wonderful publications. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff out of DuPage. Hats off to all you guys um, about the same stuff. And, and, and there are countless um, publications out there as far as kind of a more, I think what they're looking for in this question is a more kind of comprehensive thing. Um, I, I, uh, I, I can't recall anything right now. I'm, I, I would be shocked if there wasn't, but I don't recall anything right now. What was, um, Chris, the last part of that question? Uh, let me see here. It says, oops. Um, are there specific items such as maintenance, access, monitoring, et cetera, that, would, uh, that you would consider as priorities for adding to existing BMP resources? Yeah. Um, you know, um, if I had to put my finger on, on one thing, um, you know, I, it, it's, what, where I see the most damage is when either water is blocked, when water is blocked somehow, whether it's by flooding or whether within the green infrastructure. So, you know, I'm very visual, right? My hands are up. I don't know if you can see me, but so I, I mentioned these ditches or these creeks or these streams, these receiving waters are being inundated with more water, which means the water levels are higher, the flow is going faster, and the trees that predictably grow along the creeks and streams are now having their roots eroded, and these trees are falling in. And, and now you've got this, this blockage, this partial blockage in the stream. Well, when water hits that now, it's, it's going around and eating the, the bank opposite of it. And, you know, you can walk up and down any stream and every time you see a rock or a, tr a root wad or a fallen limb and you look downstream of it, you can see the effects of that, the presence of that obstacle. And, and so I, I think a really simple thing to do would be to have a program to look at these the green infrastructure and to remove impediments of flow because it's it's the impediments these things are designed beautifully they really are and but but it's their lack of maintenance that's causing them to fail and and so i think it's it's looking for that that those obstacles whatever they may be a turtle gets caught in a pipe i've seen that um a tree limb falling um you know wire across a wetland that now has caught everything and is acting like a giant beaver those are all impediments to flow. And, and to me, that, that's the low-hanging fruit for um, keeping these things moving. Very good. Uh, we, we just have a couple more uh, that we'll try to get to. Uh, this one's from Holly. What types of permits have been required uh, for wetland channel excavation or the excavation of accumulated sediment around the dry hydrant intake? Uh, wondering if that was considered maintenance and thus required a lesser, a lesser level of permitting. Yeah, good question. Um, so, so you're on the right track with all of those words. And um, I mentioned Army Corps in some instances. Um, <laughs> I mentioned EPA when we're doing hydraulic dredging to remove sediment. Um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, EPA. 
Believe it or not, EP doesn't get involved when you're doing mechanical removal. Um, and, and so it's, it's interesting in the approach, right? If your, your approach is, is hydraulic or your approach involves mats and heavy equipment, a certain set of regulators are interested. Um, if you're gonna use amphibious equipment and you're not going to um, compress the wetland and you're not gonna have a return water from your dewatering process, then a different set of regulators are interested in that. And, and so if, if you wanna um, get a hold of this presentation and go back to that Grassmere graph where I showed permitting as costs, I don't, I'm not asking to do it now, but for anybody who's, who wants to, um, you'll see the permitting costs of using the amphibious equipment was significantly less than the permitting cost running mats out there and running heavy equipment. And I, I don't wanna dodge the question, but I don't wanna say every site is different, but there is a huge variability in the permits that really are involved depending upon the approach to the job. It's a great question. And let's see, Keith, I think that's really uh, the last question that we had. I, I see a couple other comments here that uh, so offer some suggestions about, um, I, I think, getting rid of some of, the, some of the sediment in some of those smaller green infrastructure uh, things such as uh, rain gardens and whatnot. Um, but uh, we're, we're kind of up, up against the, uh, the clock here. So uh, I think we're gonna cut it off there. Um, Chris, can I share my email address? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer these offline. Absolutely, please do. Yeah. So, um, so my name is Keith Gray. So it's K Gray, G R A Y, at I L M environments.com. And as mentioned earlier, I'm in a remote part of North Carolina. So if it snows this weekend, I probably won't have internet connection. So, but I'll be back in Chicago soon. All right. Keith, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. Uh, th uh, thank you. I, I'd also like to thank everyone uh, as part of our audience for uh, joining us and asking all those great questions. Uh, we hope you've learned and enjoyed a few things from this webinar. Please remember that Mary Mitros will email everyone with a link to the presentation, a recording of the webinar, and a PDH certificate. Our next webinar is scheduled for February 10th. Uh, and we will get more information out to you guys uh, about that webinar in the very near future. Uh, I hope uh, this is a very happy, healthy, safe, and prosperous new year for everyone. Uh, again, thank you, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, everyone.